We're going to skip one break here because this is so important and there's a flow here. That's a theme that I like to pursue. And uh, talking about, again, the expansion of spine, we omitted pediatric surgery for way too long. And we have a true leader in the field here, Dr. David Skaggs. And he also is a phenomenal uh, teacher for me, for our, all of our orthopedic uh, surgery community. And um, just uh, in case you didn't know that, ortho bullets, that's the editor-in-chief of that, the most heavily downloaded and utilized uh, online resource tool and it's open for everybody so neurosurgical colleagues you want to learn more about spine great resource right there what is so impressed me about him is that he has this calm cool demeanor in terms of how to run an effective organization he's brought that now to cedars uh, from children's hospital it's such an honor to have you here thanks for being here dave yeah thank you jens and rod thank you charlie kojo thanks for putting on this amazing course so um this this is a little bit of a different talk so I'm going to propose to you the people who are training in spine now are light years ahead of where I was at this point, technically. And I think that if you really want to help your patients further your career, you can put more time into soft skills, people skills, leadership skills, than technical skills. You've already put in your 10,000 hours of screwing things. You can put metal almost anywhere in the body safely. So, this is how you're going to become a better surgeon. This is how you're going to help your patients. Disclosures. I'm a piecemeal laborer. I'm useless without my team. You know, we all are. We should admit that to ourselves. And I'm truly still working on all this stuff. So the guys here I work with, you know, keep me honest. If I'm not doing a good job, tell me. Tell me to improve. So you are a team leader. It's kind of hard sometimes when you think of yourself as struggling to get to the next stage and the top of the pyramid and get a good grade and get into a good residency and fellowship, and you're waiting for others to identify you and pick you up. And then all of a sudden, one day, you're the team leader. You know, you're gonna have people's lives in your hands, and depending on how you lead the team is gonna depend on how those people do. So we're gonna talk about a culture of preparation, empowering team members, and the unrelenting pursuit of excellence. So as a new team leader, it's a balance. And the balance is, you know, are you feeling not confident and wow, I've never done this and I've probably not been trained to do this versus overconfident. And it's hard to get that balance right. It's particularly hard for women, I think. So guys, you know, help out the women, tell everyone in the OR like, yeah, they're actually pretty good. It's a hard balance to walk. You don't want to look like a jerk, but you want people to listen to you. And an additional disclosure is surgeons think there's better teamwork in the OR than everyone else thinks. Like, look at this, the anesthesia residents here, ooh, this is kind of hard. The anesthesia residents, only 10% of the time do they think there's good teamwork in the OR, and the surgeons, 80% of the time, they think is good teamwork. So we have a lot to do here. You know, our self-perception is probably inaccurate. So James Clear is one of my favorite authors. If you haven't read it, you should get this book, Atomic Habits. Atomic means like little atoms. You know, he talks about how you don't rise to the level of your aspirations. You know, everyone has goals, so what? But you fall to the level of your systems. So to be a good team leader is all about putting systems in place. And in business school, they teach you. You put systems in place so the really good CEO, if he leaves your organization, it still works. If you have the charismatic CEO and they leave the organization and it doesn't work anymore, that person really wasn't a good leader. So Boy Scout motto, be prepared. It's corny, but it's true. Start a culture of preparation on your team. So uh, you've probably all seen these checklist books and we probably have checklist fatigue, but you know who hasn't? Parents, families haven't. So the same checklist that I hope my residents and fellows get, I hope it still happens, is the same checklist that my parents have. And the parents of my patients, they're not gonna let us forget something, trust me, they're looking at that checklist and you put them on your team. You say, you know, I have thousands of patients, you have one, don't let us forget anything here. And pre-op spine classes. So my nurse talks about the whole surgical experience. She thinks one third of it is ahead of time, one third of it is the surgery, and one third is afterwards. Yeah, that might be true. Uh, Gallup poll shows every single year, except for after 9-11, then it was firemen, nurses are the most respected profession in the United States. So having pre-op classes in which your nurses are there and you're not allowed in the room, people will ask questions that they might not ask you. 
So when I came to a new institution, I was truly in fear that something was going to go wrong. So we put everyone in the room, the neuromonitoring techs, anesthesia. We had a dummy surgery. Literally, there is a dummy there. And I thought it might be too corny. But I can't tell you how many surgeons came up afterwards and said, wow, I should have done that. So if you're going to start in a new institution, why not have a test run, put everyone in the room? And what that does somewhat is it's not just a practice but it lets everyone in the room know that you value them. This is your team, and they want to be part of it. So culture of preparation. <clears throat> You've probably had this uncomfortable experience where you're in the OR, and a surgeon's yelling at the rep because something's not there. And you know, you know, that surgeon probably didn't ask the rep ahead of time. And it was really uncomfortable, and I was a fellow watching one surgeon in particular yell at people. So I started sending an email just to the rep, like, hey, let's use this. And the scrub tech says, well, I'd like that email. And then the circulator wanted it. Next thing you know, 55 people get this email that I put out every Sunday morning. You know, it does take a little bit of work on my part. It probably takes an hour of sitting down, reading every note, looking at every MRI and CT, and planning quietly what we're going to do in surgery. But by the time you get there, everybody's read about the plan. Everybody feels respected that they were included in the plan. And a lot of times, people come up with better ideas, things I didn't think about. I'm like, wow, you're right. We could put a connector there. Or yes, you know, this person does have six lumbar vertebrae. Thanks. And the culture of preparation, one of our old fellows, Michael Vitale at Columbia, showed that if you present cases ahead of time at a pre-op conference, then a lot of the time you're going to change the plan, but almost never is the case delayed. So don't be fearful. So right now at Cedars, <clears throat> the full-time faculty members present every single case they do pre-op and post-op. We criticize each other hard. And I can't tell you how much I'm learning from this. It's wonderful to hear as many cases as you can how different people do different things. So we talked about culture of preparation, practice before you get in the OR. There's other things we can do to make things easy. So, you know, everybody seems to use different language here, and the surgeon says one thing, and the x-ray tech thinks something else. You know, I'll give this to you guys if anyone wants to email me. It made a difference. We had a grand rounds. Pat was there. We all sat down and talked about it. We came up with a common language, and I try to use this. You know, sometimes we forget. But it makes it so much quicker, and I think we could do a good study before and after showing that there's actually less fluoro because people are more likely to be in the right place the first time. And surgeons believe they should not be questioned. You know, it's the old uh, <coughs> Korean airline things where if someone believes he shouldn't be questioned, no one speaks up. The truth is, we have one brain. If something goes wrong in the OR, probably somebody else knows it and they're afraid to speak up. So when Google looked at their teams and they tried to figure out what's the thing that makes a high-functioning team, the number one thing was people feeling comfortable to speak up, having psychological safety. So you want to create that in your OR. How do you create that? If somebody has a stupid suggestion, you don't go, that's stupid. You go, wow, thanks. Let's think about that. And you know, do you want to be the surgeon who's like, do I have to yell at you again? I told you this already before. Or do you want to be the person who says, wow, thank you. Do you have any other ideas? You know, it's easy to shut people down. People are afraid to make an error because you're the team leader and you probably know more than them. But they might know, they probably do know more than you about something specific, like what tool you're going to use or what's going on with neuromonitoring. And studies have shown that if a surgeon is mean to someone in their team, you can't recover that with good leadership. It's a long, long, long time before people respect you again. So a dean at USC, who was one of these seasoned deans, I remember said, you know, Dave, almost all the time when surgeons get in trouble and behave badly, it's because they think they're protecting their patient. So watch out for this pitfall. If you like run into the CEO's office and yell and scream to protect your patient, you know, you still look like a whiny child and you're being ineffective. You know, that doesn't justify it. It's not okay. So how do you get people to speak up in the OR? You know, sometimes I say jokingly, I need all the help I can get. I'm someone's husband. You know, just have some humility, put yourself a little bit lower, ask others for help. They're willing to help you if you ask. So one of the tricks we use sometimes. If you know, we say, do the screws look good, or is that really L5? 
ask the lowest level person in the room, ask the medical student. Because if I go, yep, that's L5, people aren't gonna argue so much. But the medical student, the resident, comes to it with a fresh mind and people will argue with them. So I try to always get consensus, at least two people agree, yep, that's T12, that's our LIV, perfect. And empower everyone in the room. You know, when you do scoliosis surgery in kids, you want the blood pressure low when you dissect so you don't lose blood. And then you want a high maps of around 75 when you move the spine around so it keeps uh, having the blood flow and you don't lose signals. And what used to happen is I would ask, okay, is the blood pressure 75? We're putting in the rods. And anesthesia would always go, yep. And you'd look over and you're like, oh, no, it's 50. You're like, we're trying to get there. So it took me a while to think of this. We just put the blood pressure up in the TV Everybody in the room sees it, and once the rod's cut, it's great. Many, many people will say like, hey, we don't have the blood pressure up, and then it becomes a team effort. You know, it's not on my brain anymore, it's on someone else's brain. Okay, so be honest here. Who is good with names? I'm awful at it. My kids make fun of me every day for that. But I'm gonna propose to you, you could be good at names if you wanted to. And the reason you're not good with names is you don't care that much. So, and the way I'll prove that to you is, think of uh, if you had to memorize the names of 300 useless chemicals to get an A in orgo and get into med school, you can do it. So if you want to learn people's names, you can. You know, and what I do, it sounds kind of nerdy. <laughs> when I meet new people, I put it somewhere in Apple Notes, you know, who's in the OR that day, who did I meet at this meeting, write it down. You know, if you try, you can remember something. Okay, so here's another question. Who here, has missed an international flight just because you showed up late. Anyone? <laughs> okay, a few people. So if you want to, oh, hold on, I got off time on there. Oh, we're not gonna go to that one yet. We'll come back to that one later. Let's talk a little bit about crisis management. So if something goes wrong, like you lose signals in the OR, have that planned ahead of time. So this was a consensus you know, thing that was put out by a whole bunch of pediatrics and adult spine surgeons. When you lose neuromonitoring, you do these steps. This should be in every deformity OR in the country. And when this happens, you can simultaneously, the nurse will do something, she can read the list or he can read the list. Neuromonitoring does their thing, anesthesia does their thing. Plan ahead of time, put it on the room, preparation. So crisis management, I've, uh, only do defense work, but I've done a fair number of uh, cases over the years, and I can't tell you how many times when there's a neuromonitoring loss, almost every single time, the neuromonitoring person says, I told the surgeon, and the surgeon says, they didn't tell me. Happens almost every time. So do what they do in crisis situations, firefighters, military, if they say, we've lost signals, repeat back. You've lost signals, yep, we've lost signals. Repeat it back three times, there's not gonna be a communication error. Get over it, it's not nerdy, it's the right thing to do, we're doing pretty important stuff here. And it's good judgment, not weakness, to call on a friend. If I'm doing something and I'm losing neuromonitoring and I'm not sure what's going on or we're getting into something I haven't seen before, I would love to go, Dr. Johnson, can you please come in the room? Can you take a look at this? Maybe scrub in, tell me what you're thinking. You know, when you, something's going wrong and you're not sure, especially when you're a young surgeon, you're gonna get a little adrenaline rush. You might not be thinking clearly. Bring in an old wise surgeon like Pat and say, hey, would you mind looking at this for me? And so this was our uh, culture that anytime you lose signals for more than 10 minutes, call up someone else and have them think about it as well. And debrief, we, I learned this listening to uh, the you know, Navy flight team, the Blue Angels. After every single mission, they debrief for about 30 to 45 minutes. And they say, what could we do better? So I always start at the end, take off my gloves and say, okay guys, here's what I could have done better. I could have planned this, I could have done that better. You know, maybe moved a little bit slower, thought about something. And then everyone in the room says what they could have done better. So the leader starts, you know, put yourself in that position. And run towards your complications. Um, this will gain you respect. If you come up to a colleague and say, hey, you know, I didn't do a good job at this. Can you look at this? What do you think about it? One, your colleague feels respected. You value their opinion. You deepen your relationship with the colleague. You might learn something. We learn most from complications. 
So here's the question about who shows up late for flights. If you as the leader are often late, you will be viewed as others very negatively. And they won't tell you, you know, but people will talk about it. People talk about who always shows up late at Grand Rounds, and people roll their eyes. Because it's some combination of disrespect or incompetence. From incompetence, it's just lack of preparation or organization. Like, you kind of know how long it takes to drive to work and how long it takes to round. And, you know, sometimes you're late. But if you're always late, people notice. They don't respect you. You're less likely to get asked to be on committees or be in groups or, you know, just participate in things. And share successes with the team. You know, many, many people, like our surgical schedulers, will participate in some aspect of the surgery. And if they get that weekly email that shows, hey, here's the kid with the you know, symptomatic transitional vertebrae that we fused and is doing this three weeks later, surprised me. But they're happy to see that. They're happy to see your successes. And don't tolerate negative behavior or mediocrity. You know, in business school, they have the phrase, praise publicly, criticize privately. It's so true. You know, people have to feel that you have their back. You want them to succeed. You're not going to belittle them in front of others. You have to have a private conversation about a tough topic. A great way to do it is say, are you open to feedback? And if they go, yeah, you know, who's going to say no to that? They say yes. They've already kind of bought into it. They're asking for feedback. And it feels like it's coming from a place of love, not a place of a beatdown. And uh, one of the number one ways I've seen academic leaders fail is tolerating mediocrity because then it, you know, everybody starts to see it. You lose credibility as a leader. You're not making the tough decisions. And it's pretty easy to do this. All you have to do is send an email, document a shortcoming. When someone gets an email, they're like, whoa, this is documented. This is serious. I have to change this behavior. And so here's kind of how I view you know, meetings and getting things done. You know, we all work in huge organizations. It's kind of hard to get stuff done. And if you have a text or an email, it's fast, it's easy. But it's also very likely or easy to be judged as a negative or misinterpreted. If you have something that's important, take the time to have the personal meeting. Or even if you're going to meet with a lot of people, do all the meetings before the meeting. And it takes time, but there's no better way than one to communicate with someone to get something done. Um, so Bruce Gewertz is one of the best leaders I've ever worked with in my life. He's a big part of why I went to Cedars. He wrote this book, The Best Medicine, A Physician's Guide to Effective Leadership. And he says, my relationship with you is more important than this issue. This is a great negotiating tool. So if you're going in to talk to your new chair or something about an office or parking spot or OR time, whatever it is, don't feel like you have to win every argument. And sometimes right in the middle of a meeting, I said, you know what? My relationship with you is more important than this issue. Fine. I don't need any more OR time. It's amazing how people go, whoa, whoa, hold on, hold on. Like, you know, we, we could probably come up with something. All you have to do is say that, and people start to take your side of the argument. So we're going to do just a few things kind of practical. You know, how do you get stuff done? So Back when I was at Children's Hospital, I wanted a dedicated spine team. But you know what the nurses want? They want every nurse to be able to go into every room, and they're all the same because it just makes scheduling easier. But we know that's not good. So how do you get around this? So what we did is a study, and we had the head nurse as an author. Now, she didn't do anything, but give her a lot of credit. She started showing this at her meetings. And then all of a sudden, she's insisting, no, we only want the spine team in there. You know the study I did? Get them on your team. <laughs> no. And uh, so I think we all know that some x-ray techs are really good and others are really not good. And if you just say, I want the good x-ray tech, you know, you look like the whining surgeon. But if you put the manager of radiology on a study and you prove that a child gets three times less radiation when you have Mike, the good x-ray tech, all of a sudden, the manager insists that Mike is in your room all the time because it's that manager study. And so kind of in summary here, what you want to do as a leader is let people feel good about themselves because that's what they really care about when they deal with you. So you will have times that you have to direct people to do things or give negative feedback. But if you could do it in a way that people feel you genuinely have their back and you genuinely want them to succeed, 
you're going to be a better leader. So when I started off, I did not behave in the OR all the time like I wanted to. And I was sometimes short with people, and I was fast, people fell. And it took me kind of years to realize, that's not good for anybody. You know, we all want to enjoy spending time with each other. And one of the best times of my professional career is I walked into the room, and people put team skags on the back of their backs. And they said, yeah, this is, this is getting better now. So I hopefully, you all will do much better than I did, and you'll learn the lessons quicker than I did. So thank you all for being here. Absolutely outstanding. I turned this up. No. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so who has had, at the beginning of their residency, a leadership or conduct talk? I mean, these are not soft skills. These are elemental skills, I think. So who's had this kind of an, a kind of an orientation as to how to interact in the beginning of the residency? Show of hands. Was it with Dr. Skaggs? No. <laughs> uh, uh, Kojo, do you do something like this for your residency, the beginning of the residency, as program director? Every year? I think this is one of the most fundamental things. Tell us about your experience. Did you have a, uh, tell us who you are and, oh, okay. <laughs> we'll send him out of the room. Did he do a good job? Yeah, yeah, it's, oh. uh, uh, Daryl Fields, uh, neurosurgery resident at Pitt. Uh, just outlining the things that will um, stop us from growing in our careers and the reality of um, what being a surgeon is outside of the OR. Yeah, I, I think this is kind of be over for us. I'm uh, obviously a visionary program program director, but uh, how can we make this more uh, widespread as a resource, Dave? I mean, uh, should AANS, should AOS make this part of the curriculum for the residency programs so you have a kind of a better way of how to conduct yourself to be successful? Yeah, you know, there, it sounds great, but the risk is, you know, by the time these programs get kind of watered down, you just feel like, you know, someone's telling you, you know, do yoga and meditate and you'll feel better. Um, and it's like, you know, stop telling me that. So it's, it's tough. I think you almost have to have people wanting the, the course or the talk uh, before it sinks in. The SRS now is starting a leadership course. And yeah, and I think that the number one thing we could do is we as leaders, the faculty here, let everyone know this is important, this matters. You know, the soft skills I think used to be made fun of, and I think that people more and more are realizing that that's where we can get the most bang for the buck. And honestly, just enjoy going to work every day. Instead of feeling like people are against you, feel like they're for you. Yes, sir. David. David, that was amazing, and I guess I would like to leave uh, the, the attendees with one kind of story on this topic. Um, and it, you know, we're calling it leadership, et cetera, but treat everyone in the operating room like you want to be treated as if they were your friend or your partner or your family member. And even as a trainee, a PGY1, go up to the nurse and the scrub tech and the anesthesia person and say thank you at the end of the case. Don't just run out of the room and get back to your paperwork and your computer and your epic, all that, say thank you. And if you can, use their name. Thank you, Sarah, thank you, David, whatever. That will go a long way for building that team and they will do everything to help you for the next case. Yeah. Thank is, you, Sarah. Absolutely agree, great point. And I, you know, I worry I may get in trouble for this someday, but you guys know I generally clap everyone in the back, grab your shoulder and say, hey, thank you. You know, real heartfelt, thank you for being here, appreciate it. No. Sir, is there another question? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Brian Anderson, I'm one of the fellows here at Swedish. So um, thank you very much for that talk. That was great. Uh, just a, I don't have any small comments, but just a 50,000 foot view. I have the benefit of being in the military previously and being in the aviation community previously. And so those two communities do leadership much better than uh, we do as physicians. In fact, I didn't get any leadership training in medical school, didn't have any prior to that. I didn't have any in residency. Um, I haven't had any through my academy. So I think that this is something where we're, as thought leaders in um, at least uh, our, our attendings here in the room are, um, in, uh, in this field, we need to push the ball forward and um, uh, have some actual dedicated uh, leadership training. And um, this is a great talk, but this isn't uh, enough um, for what everybody needs in this room. Like when I was in the military, at every single rank, um, they would send you to a school, and it was a leadership school. 
And so as a lieutenant, it was a two-week school. Um, you were in residence, you were, you were there, and you were being taught, and you were working on leadership skills the entire time. As a captain, it was a four-week school. And then when you move on to as a major and lieutenant colonel, I mean, these were months-long schools. They take leadership very seriously. And um, everybody in this room is a leader, and we all interact with multiple people. And I don't think the stakes are any less for our patients. Um, than when you're leading people into battle or when you're flying uh, an airliner with 300 people on board. So I just, I want to commend you for your talk and I'm very thankful for it. And I look forward to having um, more of this leadership type training with all of these very high functioning leaders that are um, uh, in this room and um, are doing the same job. I think that you might have a mission as you move forward professionally, you'd yeah. be great at it. So one thing so, that does help actually, business school. Believe it or not, most of business school is leadership. It's a great way to learn it. Yes, sir. So Dave, just first of all, I just want to start and let you know my relationship with you is more important than me offending you with this question. So, <laughs> so, <I'm> just, <laughs> so just to you start too. off that. But, but first of all, I'm sitting in the back row listening to you guys and I'm like, I feel like I'm hanging out with Eskimos and they just found out what a icicle is. I mean, there are so many leadership programs out there. The CNS has had a program for 10 years, which is free. The AAAS has a program. The American College of Surgeons has a program. So I mean, to sit here and be like, there's no leadership program, I'm like, do you guys read your emails or do you have everything going to spam? I mean, there's so many things out there and I totally think it's important. This is the whole thing, My, I did a quality improvement uh, masters and this is exactly what everything's on. Mm -hmm. So the resources that are out there and I explore them, they are all free, at least for the neurosurgeons. They have a course every year, it's sponsored by Medtronic and, and use it because it, it's a great tool. You know, I would, I, I'll add one more thing. Oh, Brian, you go first. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I think it should be something that's mandatory in our training. Um, a lot of people aren't seeking out. Uh, you've all been given leadership positions, but people aren't necessarily seeking out leadership training. And um, but I think that needs to just be mandatory, with, whether it's in medical school or, or maybe a, a period of time in residency where you go away and you actually be trained on how to be a leader. Um, I haven't attended any of these courses. I'm sure they're excellent. Um, but I look forward to having that opportunity. Uh, I personally gained so much from your lectures, oh, Dr. Johnson. Park Nut Cedars. <laughs> well, actually, uh, it, I've taken a different role at Cedars, and that's what this is all about, is that uh, my, I, I attribute what I think my aging leadership skills are about, is that it goes back to being an athlete, it goes back to the military, and then being at Cedars for 22 years and uh, when Dave Skaggs came along and I looked at it and said, this guy has leadership skills and he's gonna take us to the next level. And that's why I wanted Dave to take my job of 21 years. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. I, I have one other idea. So we have an ORP course and this is something that I think all of you can put. So we've done this, um, this is an old AO tradition for trauma. We've done this now, we have a funding for the third annual ORP course. So we'd love to have uh, some, many of you here as faculty. It's a great way to show humility and again, put into action what you've said and we'll actually play that video. Maybe we can get you to come up here also as co-chair, but uh, think about doing educational events in your institution where you reverse the roles and you become a subservient uh, aid to the nurses and the techs in there. So let's take a 15 minute stretch networking food break and we'll get back together here at 9.